What's up everybody, John the Morgile here, going to do a quick video uh, about an observation that I made yesterday evening, that would be March 29th, 2017, of the waxing crescent moon. 3% visibility of the moon, or 3% lumination of the moon according to all accounts. And I noticed this, observed it several degrees even above the tree line. Um, which consists of maybe three or four degrees, the tree line itself, several, several degrees above that, the 3% waning crescent moon. Uh, and this was at up to about 9.30 p.m. About 9.45 it went behind the tree line, so I would estimate that it would have set behind the horizon at around 10 p.m. But what this means, um, I should mention that where I'm located at this point in the season, the sun sets for me at about 7.46 p.m. yesterday evening. And that means that the waning 3% luminated crescent moon was visible a good full two hours after complete and total sunset. Now, this is categorically physically impossible in the heliocentric model. Um, I've made a similar video documenting the full moon during broad daylight, and this is sort of the same thing but the other side of the spectrum. Um, the heliocentric layout dictates that the crescent and no moon phases would strictly be on the daytime side of the Earth, uh, just due to the nature of the heliocentric model. And at, you know, on the other hand, the full moon phenomenon should be strictly on the night side of the Earth. So uh, just to describe it a little bit better, when you're dealing with the sun, the moon, and the uh, earth, you're dealing with a single plane, more or less, it's called the ecliptic. Now, allegedly, according to the heliocentric model, the uh, earth goes around the sun around a single plane relative to the sun. That's called the ecliptic. Of course, the earth is allegedly tilted at 66.6 .6 degrees from the ecliptic, um, you know, and it allegedly spins around on an axis that's at that tilt. However, its orbit is alleged to be consistently along the ecliptic plane. Right. Now, similarly, the moon also more or less adheres to the ecliptic plane and merely diverges, according to the heliocentric model, uh, merely five degrees from the ecliptic. So what this means is that the cycles of the moon, as dictated by the heliocentric model, um, you can position the moon based on its uh, current phase, right? So if the moon is 100% full, then we know that it is on the opposite side completely, uh, opposite side of the Earth compared to the sun. And when you've got a no moon phase, then the moon and the sun would be essentially in alignment according to an observer on Earth. That's how the phases work. And so what this means is that the waning crescent or waxing crescent moons and every, you know, really, uh, maybe a week in either direction, uh, should strictly technically be uh, aligned to the daytime side of the Earth, especially when you're talking about the 3% uh, visibility crescent moons, which is about as uh, low luminosity as you're ever going to see. Now, the fact that I did observe this last night, a full two hours after sunset, um, and probably could have continued to observe it had there not been a tree line in the way, um, I did take some pictures. They didn't come out very well. I've got a very crappy phone. This is my new phone. The camera really sucks on it because I had a pretty decent phone with an okay camera and a tornado stole that from me about a month or so ago. So I got a crappy piece of whatever. Anyway, the picture that I took didn't take out, but trust me, uh, you can probably check timeanddate.com. The waxing crescent moon was totally visible two hours after sunset last night. Now, what I'm going to do instead of trying to uh, 3D model this out, and I've used some diagrams before that people would still argue against, but uh, the heliocentric model dictates uh, during the crescent moon phenomenon, the sun would be here, the moon would be about here, the earth would be here, and me, the observer, would be about there around 9.30 at night after sunset. So there's literally no possible way to observe the crescent moon after sunset whatsoever. 
what this means is that the heliocentric model doesn't work. Okay, and this is just one example. The book is going well. I want to thank you guys so far that have supported. Um, at this point, we've raised $1,258.68 since the announcement of the, uh, I'm, the book, the Flat Earth book that I'm writing. Um, so thank you guys so much. If you'd like to contribute to that, you can do so to the direct link here. It's uh, paypal.me slash themorgyle1 uh, or direct through paypal to j-o-n-e-lance at gmail.com. Uh, YouTube did away with fan funding, so that right now that's really the only option if you would like to support. Um, so again, you guys, watch that moon. Um, is a waxing crescent, so it's going to get you know uh, more and more luminous as the days go by. But last night was like the perfect, um, the perfect observation of the slightest uh, phase of the moon you're going to find, because on the 28th it was zero uh, percent; it was no moon. Uh, so last night was the uh, very, you know, 3% luminated, and it was just such a slight little, uh, you know, I used to call them fingernail moons when I was young, um, but it was the slightest little sliver of moon that you could see, and it was plainly visible several degrees above the horizon. Now, in terms of the moon, um, this is something that I touched on in the last take, so I'm glad I remembered. Uh, the moon represents, if you're, look, if you're talking about angular size, it represents about a half a degree in space. And so if you were to put two moons next to each other, ooh, 666, six, six, um, if you were to put two moons next to each other, um, they would represent one degree in space. So if you're looking at the North Pole Star Polaris, which doesn't ever move. It stays directly above the axis of rotation for all of recorded history. Now, if you look back to astronomers like uh, Ptolemy and his predecessor Hipparchus, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they're accredited with discovering what's called the precession of the equinoxes. Now, the pre precession of the equinoxes is a 26,000 year cycle, allegedly, where the sun, if I have this right, the sun rises in front of a specific constellation on the equinox repeatedly. However, there is a slow regression over thousands of years. And so, like, for example, we're exiting the age of Pisces. We're now just in the very beginning of the age of Aquarius uh, due to this so-called precession of the equinoxes, which is such a very minute change. I mean, it literally took um, Ptolemy and Hipparchus two lifetimes to notice just the most minute change of these equatorial stars on the equinox. Now, on the other hand, if, you know, the Earth is a spinning globe and the axis of it is wobbling like that, making one wobble over 26,000 years, that's a very slow cycle, although through meticulous long-term observation, uh, these very astute astronomers, uh, Ptolemy and Hipparchus, documented and noticed this. Now, 26,000 years is a long time for a cycle. If you break it down into a 360-degree cycle, we're talking about one degree over 72 years. Now, that would be extremely difficult to notice in terms of equatorial stars on the equinox, yet they did notice it because, again, of long long-term meticulous observation and documentation. Now, giving these guys credit, we can certainly say with absolute 100% certainty that these guys would have definitely noticed the North Pole Star Polaris phasing out of alignment with our North Polar Axis um, by the width of the moon over 36 years. Um, I'm 36 years old, so uh, I would have noticed it over my lifetime. Again, even just a half a degree, which would take 36 years of axial precession is what they call it, um, that would be noticeable, most obviously, according to the North Pole Star Polaris. However, the North Pole Star Polaris remains fixed above the polar axis, which means precession of the equinoxes it couldn't possibly be caused by the Earth being a spinning sphere going through an axial precession. So what I'm getting at here is that ancient astronomers uh, that were responsible for noticing such a minute change in equatorial stars over two lifetimes would have absolutely noticed the North Pole star coming out of alignment with the uh, axis of rotation over half a lifetime. Um, again, the moon represents a half a degree in space. 
I've been alive 36 years, and so where the North Pole star was in alignment with our spinning sphere North Pole, uh, it should be a full moon's width out of alignment now compared to the day I was born. And uh, if I live to be 72, then the North Pole star should be two widths of the moon. Uh, out of alignment with the axis compared to the day I was born. So since we absolutely do not see the North Pole star Polaris uh, phasing out of alignment with the center axis, it debunks the heliocentric model just as the observations of the waxing crescent moon in the middle of the night well after sunset or a full moon in broad daylight. All of these observations are categorically impossible in a heliocentric layout. Therefore, we must cast aside the heliocentric model. For, if for no other reason, then the Earth is very easily proven to be a stationary plane as opposed to a spinning sphere. But even more you know, obvious uh, astronomical observations, such as the North Pole star Polaris remaining fixed above uh, the axis, or better stated, uh, Polaris being the central point of uh, rotation for all of the other stars, um, that remaining fixed above the uh, North Polar Axis, in spite of the precession of the equinoxes, is, is an excellent proof against the heliocentric model. So uh, with that, uh, God bless you guys. Thanks for watching. Spread the word, spread the world, and peace.